as social structures evolve and their values and rituals change, how is architecture keeping up? The family uh, and, and family values, of course, are very loaded terms. These are words that are used uh, very often by politicians, especially on the right, because they touch on anxieties about social change. Invoking the family is often used uh, to build a dynamic of inside and outside, public and private, foreign and native. And these images are common today in the political discourse of many countries, um, in part because we're facing a global, uh, a series of global challenges and struggling whether to face them together or to take care of our own first, however you want to define our own. So the idea of a family as a microcosm for society is itself problematic. There have always been many kinds of families, uh, but only some were sanctioned by legal systems or celebrated in literature, film, television. And in particular today, we live with the social inheritance of a 20th century family, and especially the myth of the nuclear family. And yet today, society and architecture are transforming at different rates, and parts of contemporary life, uh, I think, are clearly misaligned with some of the spaces that they occupy. And the acceptance of a greater variety of family configurations is one of the easier changes to identify, but it's still a blur. As Naomi Stead writes, what used to seem progressive becomes commonplace, what was daring becomes tame, what was queer becomes ordinary. Such are the processes of normalization and such processes calcify in architectural form. So in this series, we're gonna hear from experts on historical encounters between architecture and ideas of family. And these case studies or moments of clarity are gonna be followed by other talks that survey the contemporary environment for evidence of new and extended families. And today we begin with a look at the family room, which is maybe not ground zero for the nuclear family, but it's close. And joining us uh, live from Wellington, New Zealand is Jamie Jacobs. Jamie is the Director, Central Region for Heritage New Zealand, Bohere Taonga. Previously, he was an architectural historian for the Historic American Buildings Survey and the National Historic Landmarks Program, both at the United States National Park Service. Jamie is the author of Detached America, Building Houses in Post-War Suburbia, and he's currently working on a comparative study of post-World War II housing in New Zealand and the United States. So let's welcome Jamie. Uh, thanks to Lev and his team at the Canadian Centre for Architecture to give me this opportunity um, to share this interesting part of architectural history, and a, a lot of my life has been spent researching it, and also for pushing the start time back a bit. Morena, good morning. Uh, it's 8 a.m. in Wellington on Friday. Um, I was really excited when Liv found me um, for a number of reasons that he found me at all because I published on a different name than I am known professionally here. Um, but also I, I had thought the week that I was going to publish the book Detached America that should be called Family Room, um, which unfortunately it was a little late for that. So I'm really excited to um, get started and share this information with you. Um, so I'm going to um, just talk about a couple of notes, assumptions, and definitions before I get uh, really get started. One is I'm going to refer to the United States often with the shorthand of America and American. I know that sometimes annoys other North Americans, um, but it's uh, primarily for efficiency, and there aren't a lot of other alternatives. Um, Low density suburban development um, is another thing. Casual uh, Canada, Australia, New Zealand had comparable and immense post war suburban expansion. And the contexts are key for the United States that there was extreme government intervention in the private housing industry, feverish consumerism around houses, and their intense marketing. And that's something I'm looking at in my comparative study here in New Zealand. And the staggering scale of construction, just to give you an idea, there are 35.5 million housing units. Most were detached houses built between 1945 and 1970 in the US, an average of 1.5 million a year. Um, I'm also going to talk, we've got to assume what I call the imagined consumer. Builders of houses in the United States in the two or so decades following World War II designed and marketed houses with a specific consumer in mind. They were white, upwardly mobile, middle-class, middle-income nuclear families. This doesn't discount, discount race. And in, in the book, the larger study, I do discuss race. Um, but the, the building industry was looking at these people who are willing to trade up and buy up to something better as the focus of their marketing and the focus of their product development. Um, 
Regarding the middle class, post-war America saw an unprecedented expansion and transformation of the middle class that was made up from middle income working class through the upper middle class. So it's this um, massive monolithic middle class. And I, I make some distinctions between these um, classes within the middle class, and you, you'll hear, that, hear about that. Um, but one thing I'm arguing is that this idea that there's a monolithic middle class in the US, which is a fallacy, is in part possible because of the adoption of casual living, that there is this casual living approach to living that all people adopted. Um, the post-war period that I'm discussing for, um, for over two decades after 1945, the building industry prospered by maintaining laser sharp focus and marketing on a single product, the detached single family house designed to a specific demographic, which I already discussed, but nuclear families who were white middle class and upwardly mobile. That was almost 100% of their focus for this period. That begins to soften in the late 1960s for three major reasons, um, advances in civil rights, the splintering of the consumer market and inflation, the latter of which quickly cooled decades of rapid expansion and experimentation. Um, and finally, the term family room um, has become near universal when applied to a second living area in American houses. But during uh, the period we're talking about, it was used interchangeably with recreation room, den, study, second living room, game room, rumpus room, and I just found even a children's boom boom room, among others. Um, so I settled on umbrella terms that you'll hear that are both historical in nature, they do appear, um, but they also conceptually represent a certain phase of, of <clears throat> or room type. Um, so with that out of the way, um, let's get started. Um, at first enjoyed and endorsed by the most privileged uh, families in post-war suburbia, the family room ultimately became wildly popular, ubiquitous, and iconic among Amer uh, spaces in 20th century American houses. Through a combination of firsthand experiences and media depictions, a person would be hard pressed to find someone who could not make an attempt at describing one. More likely than not, <clears throat> this description would characterize the family room as casual or informal. As you will see, this is unsurprising given that the family room was only the latest in a rich lineage of such spaces in the United States. However, distinct from the rooms of the past, the family room and its slightly older post-war cousins emerged at a time when casual living became its, began its ascent and as the preferred and eventually dominant lifestyle for American families. Casual living revolutionized American family life during the second half of the 20th century and was the core driver of the family room's formation. So what is it? The ethos of casual living valued friendly and easygoing domestic environments and downplayed inflexible social boundaries and rigid rules of conduct. A dynamic consumer culture provided the platform for the acceptance of casual living in the suburbs. With rising national wealth shared by unprecedented numbers of households, middle-class families could choose to participate nearly through the purchase of certain material goods, the house being the most consequential. In 1950, successful product designers and cultural commentators, Mary and Russell Wright observed, quote, a new way of living, informal, relaxed, and actually more gracious than any other strained imitation is in fact growing up. There is evidence all around that the hard shell of snobbish convention is cracking. This new way of living was not just something predicted or noted by elite tastemakers, but a mass social revolution extending from rapid change of life circumstances for what would eventually be a majority of families. Within the household, the primary manifestation of casual living was a stress on togetherness as families spent more time at home, frequently engaged in group activities or individual ones in shared spaces. Removed from extended families and tight-knit rural towns and ethnic urban neighborhoods, and still reeling from the twin traumas of economic depression and war, suburban households turned much of their attention inward, strongly embracing a gendered nuclear family structure. Resources were overwhelmingly spent on the house and home, its purchase, outfitting, maintenance, and enjoyment. The idea that families would find deep satisfaction in their time spent together became so ingrained 
that in 1951, the National Council on Family Relations identified the problem of a lack of busy families, a category defined in part by those who, quote, don't know what they are missing by not growing on family togetherness. A high degree of informal interaction with other households was also a benchmark of casual living. The well-known journalist Henry Harry Henderson investigated mass-produced suburbs for Harper's Magazine in 1953. The article focused on how the character of life unfolding in the new suburban neighborhoods was without precedent. Henderson explained, quote, gone are most rituals and ceremonies. If you want to know someone, you introduce yourself. There is no waiting for the right people. A writer in Better Homes and Gardens in 1950 contended that an easygoing living environment lacking all forms of pretense made life more enjoyable. This article and others like it in lifestyle magazines encouraged their readers to welcome a casual lifestyle as a way to reduce social distinctions and to create a neutral ground for interacting with neighbors with different personal histories and backgrounds. The topic of reducing formality in day-to-day -day life was a decidedly middle-class conversation. Still, the interests and needs of the newly suburbanized middle-income working class also influenced this trend. A 1959 study of working-class women found that they believe, quote, the charm and advantages of an inexpensive and unostentatious house means that a family can relax more easily and feel more genuinely at home. Whether members of the established middle class or rising middle income working class, households locating to new dwellings in the suburbs began to revolutionize their family and social lives through a belief in the value of a more casual lifestyle. The concept of casual living became closely linked to a single house form even before builders made specific attempts to accommodate it through design. No matter where in the country it appeared, the basic six room ranch house, living room and dining room, kitchen, three bedrooms and one bathroom was thought to provide direct access to the allure of a relaxed Californian or Western lifestyle. The ranch house projected a modern life of ease and represented hopeful promise for a generation pursuing what they saw as quote, a brand new life in a brand new world. The idealized ranch house attained legendary status in the post-war mind, but in most places, it did not provide significant space for casual living except outdoors. Within the decade following World War II, however, a series of at first jumbled design responses began to concretely address casual living in the form of living kitchens, kitchen family rooms, and recreation rooms. In the 1950s, casual living transformed the kitchen from a workroom into one of the centers of household activity. In the minimum houses built immediately after the war, which you see plans of here, the compactness and out of the way location of kitchens were overlooked as they were fully equipped with the latest appliances and household technologies. Very quickly, however, a small and isolated work center became unacceptable. Although the building trade and lifestyle presses initially promoted open planning as a solution where walls are reduced or removed, um, the more successful strategy was to introduce more activities into a modestly enlarged kitchen. A 1950 article in the Los Angeles Times noted this, that space planning in new houses was quote, opening up the kitchen to include other family activities than cooking and eating. The kitchen became internally more multifunctional with nothing more remarkable than the addition of space for a table and chairs. And here you see plans of two very typical um, kitchen plans for where you fit, uh, fit eating. One is an L-shaped one with eating in the kitchen and one is an eating area kind of adjacent to the workspace. This photograph, um, while it does show the kitchen open to the dining room, there's a bifold door that is generally was generally closed. That was a house I toured, but you can see the um, uh, casual dining space, which is actually built into the kitchen in that image. The living kitchen appealed to women for different reasons. In 1953, House and Garden Magazine highlighted the relationship between women and servantless households and the kitchen's redesign. 
further elaborating that women, quote, transform the clinical looking kitchens of the 1930s and 40s into such varied living kitchens that you see in this issue. Much of the imprint concern for women's isolation and increased time spent in the kitchen was directed to established middle-class households coming to terms with the near total disappearance of household servants. For the suburbanized members of the working class on their way to becoming middle class, the attraction was understandably different. As noted in Mary Russell Wright's Guide to Easier, Easier Living, these quote, American families have never been able to afford domestic help and would not have noticed, let alone lamented its disappearance. The kitchen was the center of daily work and social life for urban working class women. In the idea of what Shelley Nichols termed the social kitchen, moved with them when they relocated to the suburbs. Cramped kitchens found in most houses in the late 1940s and early 1950s did not allow working class tran transplants to replicate urban social kitchens, but changes were on the horizon. In a 1953 uh, article in Parents Magazine, Gladys Ruth Hanmer described her living kitchen and some of the ways it contributed to, its house, to the household's smooth functioning and sociability. Quote, it is a commons room. Family and friends just naturally gather around the table for an evening of cards or a spot of conversation. If Bill, my husband, has some office homework to do over the weekend, the dining area of the kitchen is the most natural place for him to work on his papers. The table also makes a wonderful workplace for my two sons. Having the family within earshot makes my work seem easier. We are proud of the warm ties of unity in our family and feel certain that these ties have been stimulated by this place in which we can all do things together. And you see a uh, photograph and a plan of Han the Hanmer family's living kitchen on the screen. Hanmer's reflections pinpoint how a simple physical change to the kitchen engendered a significant functional and perceptual shift of the space. In 1956, Hot Point Appliances ran an advertisement and architectural record that illustrated the advantages and appeal of a modish living kitchen. The text and graphics of the ad advertisement are revealing, quote, Hot point living room kitchens are what the 1956 home buyer wants. In fact, it's a fact this year's prospects are looking for kitchens that are as warm and friendly and beautiful as the other living areas of the home. Kitchens for living in and entertaining in. Accompanying in in illustrations depict how women might use a living kitchen, of course resplendent with hot point appliances. For example, in one scene seen here, an undoubtedly middle-class woman prepares a meal in a large and comfortable, uh, color, uh, a large and colorful kitchen, while a female visitor, accessorized with hat, gloves, and handbag, sits at the table. The image suggests that a fashionable living kitchen would be proper enough for entertaining visitors, and that the visit would not slow completion of household tasks. The living kitchen provided attractive and versatile space. It eased isolation of domestic work by encouraging visitors and family activities and allowed women greater freedom in how they manage their own work processes, child rearing and socializing. All of this was accomplished through an area for, for a table and chairs. A change that became one of the most complete housing trends in the period for all house forms everywhere in the country. The functional and conceptual expansion of the kitchen into a living kitchen was roughly paralleled by the creation of casual lounge, lounge space in what can be termed a secondary living area. Two principal design arcs for such spaces in the house, um, two principal design arcs introduced such spaces in the house. In one, the living kitchen was further enlarged with a contiguous lounge area, creating the somewhat larger kitchen family room. In the other, the existing basement recreation room morphed into the lower level recreation room of three new multi-story house forms, the split level, the bi-level, and the split foyer. The kitchen family room and the lower level recreation room are the direct antecedents of the post-war family room. 
The next logical step after the enlargement of the kitchen into a, a living kitchen, which you see images of here, uh, was its further enlargement with a lounge area. This trend was positioned by some as a contemporary update on rooms of the American past, such as the colonial keeping room and the rural farm kitchen. These were places understood to be where general living occurred simultaneous in a place of domestic work. Um, and see, you have, see here that there's a family room and a kitchen and the plans um, that incorporate dining, lounging and workspace. And then the photographs um, are from a, an advertisement in 1960 for houses outside Washington, DC. Uh, you've got a TV sitting behind the casual dining space in the upper right, and then a family um, standing around in a kind of lounge space with a breakfast bar on the lower left. Sunset Magazine reported on the phenomenon of living kitchens in 1956, explaining that from Seattle to San Diego, space for activities as varied as children, children's play and crafts, household mending and ironing, and the pouring of drinks, quote, was never too far from the kitchen range and a pot of coffee, or from the refrigerator and ingredient, ingredients for an after-school snack. The plans and photographs accompanying the article all depicted spaces where the lounge and casual dining areas were within the bounds of the kitchen or in an adjacent area. Like the living kitchen, the kitchen family room was multifunctional and variable when considering size finishes and location in the house. The working, dining, and lounging areas also had more physical and functional overlap than what came later, and they occupied less space within the house than the living and dining rooms, despite their high level of use. The companion house for family living, seen here, sponsored by the Women's Home Companion in 1955, anchored the house with the kitchen family room at its center. While recognizing its growing importance and desirability, the total amount of square footage allotted to the kitchen family room was considerably less than the nearby living and dining rooms combined. Kitchen family rooms appeared most frequently in, in one-story houses and those lacking a basement or lower levels. New multi-story house forms appeared in the 1950s with their own type of casual living space, the recreation room. George Nelson and Henry Wright, both outspoken advocates of modern design, wrote about what they termed in 1945, the room without a name. The authors explain the desirability of this type of room. Quote, it marks the first time for the whole, the first time a room for the whole family has appeared in the house since the days of the farmhouse kitchen. The big room is intentionally set up to cover the family's social and recreational needs, and that the usual adult versus children distinction has been abandoned. That Nelson and Wright called the space the room without a name underscores the newness of the idea of casual living as a character defining feature of suburban life and also the then uncertain effects on the house. Over the next decade, a standalone room for casual living gained in popularity. Similar to the kitchen, two kitchen family rooms, the recreation room was a multifunctional place where the division between domestic work and leisure was fluid. Virtually any activity could occur there, sometimes simultaneously. From children's play to domestic work to adult parties, the room was, according to American Builder in 1955, a catch-all for the entire range of household activities. And here you see a woman doing some mending on her um, sewing machine, a child reading uh, with her uh, father, and then also the television is in the space. In 1953, House and Home described the room as a place, quote, where children can play and eat and be under their mother's eye while she works where the mother can sew or sort laundry without having to clean up everything when company comes. A 1955 book on home decoration stated, the extra room can be anything you want to make it. While published articles again found antecedents in colonial and Victorian houses, the principal origin of the recreation room was itself only a generation old. Beginning in the 1920s with the modernization of laundry and heating equipment, basements not prone to dampness became ideal places for additional living space. 
Adults generally use the basement recreation room for domestic tasks, with the rem remainder of time given over to children's play. At times, the space might also serve as a quirky location for informal parties, or was merely, in the words of a writer for American Home Magazine, quote, a place to let our hair down. And here you have some images of post-World -World War II parties in a basement recreation room where you can see the ductwork and the joists unfinished and a bar set up on the, um, on the large utility sink and that's the, dishwasher, the washing machine behind them. And then uh, on the bottom again, you see the, the ducting and the pipework uh, as well as the sort of lack of large windows. A basement recreation room augmented a house's level of livability, but was often finished after a house's initial construction on an as-needed basis. Located near the furnace, the laundry, and occasionally the garage, it remained a socially and functionally peripheral space. Described as, quote, makeshift and an afterthought, the room's lack of natural light and location remote from other living spaces demanded some other solution. In the 1950s, the basement recreation room was updated and repackaged as part of casual living's rise among su suburban families. This transformation was part of the development of three new house forms, the split level, the split foyer, and the bi-level, all multi-story versions of the esteemed ranch house. They pragmatically emerged from an environment where buyers desired more space at a time when land costs were skyrocketing and builders also accepted that most people still found one-story houses ideal for modern, um, modern family life. What you see here are eleva um, elevations and then sections of the three house types, where you have on the upper level or the upper levels in the split level of live, eat, and sleep. Those are essentially all ranch house plans um, with the extra space located in this partially above grade um, um, space where you have recreation and utility spaces. More than any other element, the lower level of finished at grade or slightly below grade space was their strongest draw. This level was most frequently contained in a garage, laundry, most frequently contained a garage, laundry, utility room, and the much sought after recreation room. With larger and greater numbers of windows and better finishes and insulation, the revamped room lessened or eliminated such discomforts found in, in a basement recreation room as dampness, cold floors, and dim lighting. As noted by the Washington Post in 1958, builders were, quote, taking the rec out of rec room with durable and attractive finishes and a space geared to serve many purposes. And you see here our um, this is a split foyer form on the right and a split level of plan on the left, uh, as well as two images, um, one a photograph and one um, a, an image from a magazine. In most cases, these multi-story ranch houses also included a living kitchen, a kitchen with table space, which further supported casual living in the house. In the split level, particularly the adjacent locations of the living kitchen and the lower level recreation room also foreshadowed the development of an entire zone for casual living in the 1960s. And uh, if you look at the left, left image, you can see the stairs go down from the kitchen right into the recreation room. And that's what I'll be talking about now. Households initially welcomed any type of space for casual living, but the initial forms became less ideal over time. Middle-class families continued to pursue a home-based lifestyle through the 1960s, but one that was more complicated and not ideally supported through existing plans. During this decade, the family room grew in size, was moved to a more prominent location, and contained levels of finish similar to other public spaces, all contributed to the creation of a house having two distinct and equal zones for daytime living one active and casual, and one quiet and formal. And you see them here, and I'll return to this uh, image later. The ultimate establishment of not just the family room, but an entire zone for casual living demonstrates the degree to which it revolutionized the suburban house and its resident household in the middle decades of the 20th century. And this image is from 1945, but it's really hard to um, show sort of chaos and a partness. I'll be talking about a partness um, um, in this section. 
So togetherness among family members attained near cult status in the 1950s, but towards the end of the decade, togetherness began to lose its luster. Writing for the New York Times in 1958, Charles Frankel, a social philosopher at Columbia University, explained that togetherness, quote, is a friendly condition and no one likes to make a principle of unfriendliness, end quote. Yet he went on to observe that togetherness, quote, is also a strenu strenuous condition and no one likes to admit he cannot keep up the pace. T togetherness is becoming somewhat of a nuisance, end quote. Family members, especially siblings, did not always want to play nicely with each other, and it was difficult to read or concentrate on homework in a room with the distraction of a television or stereo. Togetherness could also be tiring as it required coordinated schedules, a near impossibility for most families as children grew older. A writer for the Los Angeles Times pragmatically observed in 1957 that, quote, you have to take togetherness where you can find it but it's pretty difficult to achieve togetherness among all family members of a family at one time. The paramount value of togetherness also began to be doubted for more complex reasons. Joseph Prendergast, executive director of the National Recreation Association cautioned in 1962, quote, don't overdo togetherness. A 1961 feature on the YWCA offered experts are advocating plenty of apartness in everyone's life. Helen Southard, a YWCA staff psychologist, believed that, quote, togetherness has been oversold and overdone as a solution for all manner of family problems as well as juvenile delinquency. Families needed to, de quote, determine when and what kind of togetherness is needed and at different times if for no other reason than preventing the members of a family from boring one another silly when they are together, end quote. As togetherness came under question, the desire for greater privacy within the house began to take hold. In 1957, the Congress on Better Living, an annual meeting of women in Washington, DC, sponsored by McCall's Magazine, concluded that privacy was the number one thing lacking in typical houses. The Washington Post headlined its coverage of this event with the observation that privacy, that quote, privacy at home is a crying need. Everybody from baby to daddy needs a corner of his own, end quote. Four years later, the participants at a home furnishings convention in Los Angeles believed that a new trend had been established valuing, quote, the preciousness of privacy over the tedious, tediousness of togetherness. Providing each child with a household, of the household with a bedroom and the parents with their own master bedroom and private ensuite permitted privacy within the house. However, a desire for apartness was not always total. And those not wanting full seclusion increasingly found it in public areas thoughtfully zoned for different ty types of activities and style of living. We're looking at the recreation room and the fam um, kitchen family room. The physical utility and character of kitchen family rooms and the lower level recreation room was questioned not long after they first became, uh, first became widely available in the 1950s. The delegates to the 1958 Congress on Better Living concluded that such spaces have, quote, become too many things to too many people. On the other side of the country, a panel of Los Angeles housewives gathered in 1961 to review building industry house plans found the variations in design problematic. The variety of casual living spaces ranged, quote, from vague extensions of the living room to fully enclosed separate areas. As a result, the panelists believed that they, um, they had become, quote, too nebulous to be of much value. The spaces tended to be a catch-all without doing any one thing well, end quote. In the 1960s, the family room rose in status as a second living area, equal importance to the function of the living room and its popularity and desirability soared. Cynthia Kellogg, a design columnist for the New York Times, straightforwardly reported in 1958, quote, the family room, a mid-century innovation, grows increasingly popular, end quote. By 1965, a writer for the Chicago Tribune could more confidently state, quote, the family room, once considered a nice to have feature in a home, now has achieved 
near my status with today's new home buyers, end quote. Features in newspapers and popular periodicals were matched by opinions of both builders and homeowners. Charles and Helen Lodge recalled that during the selection and customization of their builder's model in the mid-1960s in Glenshaw, a suburb of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, their builder, quote, talked about how the family room was being frequently being included in new homes, end quote. The couple was already familiar with the space as, quote, most of our friends with new homes had family rooms. The Lodges understood the limitations of a recreation room in a split foyer house because they had lived in one for, a past, for the past decade. The Lodges sought a room that was more conveniently located and better finished, a second rather than a secondary lit room for living. Although the living room and the family room are often viewed solely as either informal and formal, their post-war relationship was deeper than the superficial comparison of their appearance or a narrow, narrow focus on one aspect of their character. A panelist from Boston who participated in a nationwide survey in 1965 titled Housing Design and the American Family offered different terms to describe her living room and family room, which give a near perfect structure to how these rooms evolved in the 1960s. In discussing them, she stated, quote, I don't like the use of the words formal and informal. I prefer that to use the words quiet and active. I like an active family room and that's where the TV is. And I like a quiet room, which is our living room. And my husband and I use it all the time. It is a place where we have a drink, a cocktail or some coffee and I'll knit or mend and he'll read. The children are also welcome there for quiet activity, for playing solitaire if they like or reading their books. I feel it should be a restful and a welcome place, end quote. In the 1960s, the living room became a comfortable place for quiet and formal activities of all family members. Surveys and interviews with original homeowners in the Lyndhurst Estates, Pickwood and New Glen Manor subdivisions built in Glenshaw in the 1960s explained the varied uses of living rooms and houses that also had family rooms at the time of construction. All of the owners in some ways indicated that their family rooms allowed their living room to be nicely furnished and remain neat at all times. They also revealed that the living room was hardly a static place. Family used them for a variety of quieter pursuits, such as cards, dinner parties, instrument playing, meetings, resting, reading, doing homework, writing out bills and letters, and quote, conversation time with family members, end quote. The family room became an active and casual foil to the quiet and formal living room, again for use of all family members. The family room maintained its function as a setting for children's play during the day. For example, a convenient family room was important to Albert and Dolores Saibo when looking to build a new house in 1970 because, quote, our children were small so they could be on the same floor with us without being underfoot. The family room was also thought to be a place where teenagers could entertain guests in a separate location, but one that could still be monitored. A Los Angeles mother indicated in 1964 that she wanted, quote, a place for my daughter to go with her company, end quote. These observations in, uh, demonstrate that age divisions were still in place to a certain degree. And there were few recommendations for the children of a household to entertain their friends in the living room. Still, the family room of the 1960s was also in common use by adults. It became the preferred location for the television and often the stereo, the common location of the fireplace, and the place for less structured social gatherings and playing games. The family room became a location associated with a certain type of domestic leisure. It ceased being a functional catch-all and instead uh, was the place for active and casual living. The emphasis on leisure in the family room meant that there was a marked reduction of domestic work activities there and a more refined version of casual living increasingly occupied a more prominent place in the house and household. And what you see here are two plans. One is a one-story plan and one is a two-story plan showing how the family room has become larger and more central. And then there's a family room in the upper right and then a living room on the lower left uh, photographs from the period. 
for a middle suburban middle class, um, for the suburban middle class, multi-purpose rooms of any type began to fall out of favor, and differentiated space became again a tangible marker of middle class um, uh, mark, marker of middle class membership. The division between work and leisure also reflected its gendered realities. Middle class house, housewives who spent most of their days in a place of both work and leisure found that leisure could not be easily achieved if it occurred in the same rooms as domestic work. Builders were attuned to all these cultural currents. As part of the improvements made to an existing model in 1959, Scholl's homes relocated laundry facilities to a utility area adjacent to, but removed from the family room seen here. Their justification for this change referenced a goal to make the family room more explicitly a place for living, explaining that before this alteration, the living room was, quote, neither fish nor fowl, not wholly a living area, not nor wholly a work area. There are many precedents in the history of American domestic architecture where prosperous families had two rooms loosely corresponding to the post-war living room and family room the hall parlor plan and colonial dwellings, the farm kitchen and sitting room and rural homesteads, and the front and back parlors of Victorian houses. Thought to be outmoded and obsolete for modern family life, Victorian era houses nonetheless became convenient as a marketing angle in the 1960s. The headline for a 1963 advertisement in the Chicago Tribune carefully balance the favorable associations of differentiated space and status with the ex expectations of contemporary home life. Quote, the finest homes on Grandmother's Day had both a formal parlor and sitting room. Today, every family can enjoy a better 1963 version of this practical arrangement. And what you see here are a variety of ha um, house plans showing um, a two parlor plan, so to speak. As with the contemporary development of kitchen family rooms and recreation rooms in the 1950s, having two living areas and houses of the 1960s was also linked to the past. One of the linchpins in the creation of two equal areas for living was the movement of the family room to a more central position in the plan and its increase in overall size. Herman York was an architect with close ties to the residential building industry and his design were often bellwethers of trends. In a 1966 retrospective of his work, York's top 1959 model positioned the second living area, quote, nearer the front door, now as important as the living room, anticipating a widespread change in new houses in the 1960s. The higher profile location of the family room demanded more thought be given to its appearance. In 1963, American Builder explained that the family room was not only increasing in size, but also, quote, has gained importance as a design element in the house. With domestic work removed, the family room could become better finished. As a place for active and casual living, the family room needed furniture and finishes that were durable, but also tastefully coordinated. In attaining this balance of function and fashion, whether contemporary or more traditional in style, family rooms frequently were fitted with built-in bookcases or cabinets, featured vaulted or beamed ceilings, and had one or more walls sheathed in wood paneling, and more and more the house's only fireplace. The refinements that made the family room and raised its status relative to the living room did not by themselves consolidate the daytime rooms into two zones. The dining room and casual dining space of the living kitchen shared a parallel relationship to the living room and family rooms, and thoughtful circulation and planning delineated and buffered these zones. While the workspace of the living kitchen served both zones, its own casual living origins meant it was more fully part of the living, uh, more part of the active and casual zone. A building industry survey of 10,000 homeowners concluded the 1967 home buyer wanted a separate family room near or adjacent to the kitchen. And what you see here, again, it's, uh, there's a, a key, is that there's a um, quiet, and, uh, quiet and formal zone towards the front, often an active and casual zone towards the back, and then a private zone in these houses. The close relationship of the living kitchen and the family room could be underscored through shared decor. 
This had already occurred in the quiet and formal rooms, which are usually filled with good furniture and heirlooms, since active living, always a threat to having nice things, was occurring elsewhere. In contrast to the living and dining rooms, which tended to be plainly finished outside of their furniture and objects, the living kitchen and family room were often visually united through fixed materials and finishes at the time of construction. Um, and this floor plan is not of the lodge house, but their floor plan is a similar one, but flipped. Um, so you can read uh, the similar type of floor plan. In 1966, Charles and Helen Lodge specified a group of upgrades to the materials and finishes of their living kitchen and family room during the design of their new neo-colonial house. They departed from builder specifications and created an ensemble that at the time was probably best understood to be an updated colonial interior. In the kitchen, they ordered cabinets with grain wood doors, strap hinges, and hammered black metal poles seen on the lower left, or lower right, sorry, and had a chair rail installed in the table area. In the adjacent family room, built in bookshelves, recycled brick for the fireplace, and hardwood floors of planks pegged into place complemented the living kitchen. The, these choices not only strongly related to a house, the house's overall architecture, but also set the spaces apart from the quiet and formal rooms elsewhere on the first floor. The zoned house available to prospective buyers in metropolitan suburbs at the end of the 1960s was appreciably distinct from typical ones available at the end of the 1950s and bore little to no resemblance to ones found in subdivisions right after World War II. By the 1960s, the establishment of a family room equal in status to the living room spurred the development of a system of zoning for daytime use zones, one quiet and formal, one active and casual. This planning trend both fostered and responded to a level of complexity in middle-class family life that fully reversed decades of spatial simplification in the house. While the largest of houses constructed at the end of the 1960s still meet the minimum level of expectations for housing, for many families in the early 20th century, they no longer represent the domestic ideal for contemporary home life. Aside from the massive garage, the most intriguing departure from the house as it stood in 1970 is the complete ascendancy of casual living, evidenced by the plans such as the one you see here. The rooms making up the active and casual zone from the end of the post-war period have collapsed into a vast multifunctional space that combines living, dining, and opulently finished work kitchen work areas. Such great rooms and togetherness dominate the spatial organization of living space in suburban houses. And if anybody watches HGTV, um, they're often removing walls, even in urban houses now. I imagine in the future, there'll be an attempt to replace all of those walls. Where vestigial, quiet, and formal zones are still discern discernible in this plan, they are much reduced and increasingly jettisoned in exchange for a home office, a media room, or tellingly a flex room with no assigned function. An interesting throwback to the room with a, without a name and likely very um, useful during pandemic home life. In conclusion, the detached single family house that became commonplace in the suburbs by 1970 remain the starting point and incubator for nearly every standard room, planning convention, and amenity available in most new suburban houses being constructed today. The astonishing and largely unpredicted architectural and cultural transformation of the post-war house from pinched minimum models after the war to spacious zone ones is one of the great milestones in the history of domestic architecture in the United States. A spatial evolution in which casual living in the family room had starring roles. Kia ora, thank you.